This week on Fantasy Forecast Central, we have two great guests for you today. Paul Greco, he stops by again. He's from FP911.com and KABB Fox 29 Daytime down in San Antonio, Texas. We'll talk about the RG3 Mike Shanahan situation down in Washington and how that affects you, the fantasy owner. Lenny Melnick from Sirius XM Radio. He's a longtime fantasy guru from the Roto Experts Fantasy Show. He'll stop by and talk about Adri- what Adrian Peterson owners should do moving forward. We also have our fantasy playoff starts and sits. We'll answer some Twitter questions, all that and much more right here on Fantasy Forecast Central, right here on the Pro Football Central Radio Network. Time now for Fantasy Forecast Central Radio. Here's Nick Slegel and Brian Dizelski. And welcome to another edition of Fantasy Forecast Central Radio. My name is Nick Slew, and I'm joined, as always, by Brian Dazowski. Uh Week 14 is in the books. Fantasy playoffs have kicked off officially. Uh, and a lot of sad news uh, this week. We had another two players having you know pretty good seasons go down. Uh, Rob Gronkowski and Taron Mathieu, um, both with ACL tears. Um, we can also add Jonathan Stewart to the list with a torn MCL, you know, after missing most of the season to injury. Uh, this has just been really the year of injuries, you know, and it's... It's sad because we hear so much about Gronk being uh, fragile now and everything like that. But I think, for me, the player that it actually hurts the most here is Honey Badger. Um, having a fantastic fantasy season for IDP guys out there, he's actually tied potential for Potential Defensive Rookie of the Year. Yeah, Potential Defensive Rookie of the Year. He's actually tied for eighth in total fantasy points for all defensive backs. Uh, that's safeties and corners. Uh, he's uh, the fourth highest safety. Uh, one, two, five, fifth fifth highest safety so i mean he's just been having a monster year according to pro football Focus's grades he's the second highest graded cornerback and also safety um just having a ridiculous year really hurts arizona um and it hurts a lot of idp owners i mean i was riding this guy high he has over 100 fantasy points this year that's huge i have offensive players on my teams that don't have as many points as honey badger did this year yeah you know this acl thing nick is Beyond out of control, in my opinion, and I could end up going off topic completely and going on an uncensored rant here about how I feel the product is in the NFL in terms of tackling and what these guys at the safety corner and linebacker position, their piss poor attempts at throwing shoulder block tackles to try and make the big play as opposed to wrapping up with two hands and simply taking a guy down all because they, they feel that now that the NFL has shifted from, you can't go near the head that that's the only part of the body left to tackle a guy is from the knees down. And I, I don't know. I maybe I'm in the minority here when I say this, but I think it's absolutely ridiculous. I think it's pathetic. And these guys, superstars like Rob Gronkowski, Reggie Wayne, and the list goes on and on. A rising star in Teron Matthew are going to miss seasons and chunks of their career because these idiot defensive players don't know how to properly tackle and. This whole this whole fantasy season, it seems like every week we had we talked about somebody go down with an ACL injury or and the, I know that one week I don't remember what week it was Nick it was week five week four somewhere in that range where there was like four people on the list that went down in one week. I mean it's absolutely inexcusable. I like I said I'm, I could go off topic for an hour and just get into a raging anger state of mind talking about this but the the lack of tackling in this league is the in my opinion primarily primarily the main reason that Gronkowski went down with an ACL injury this that was an absolute horrific way to tackle a guy he absolutely targeted the knee he dove at the knee instead of just taking his two arms running at Gronkowski and wrapping him up and taking him down he decided to just spear Gronk's knee to take him out and man I I, I, I don't know what else to say other than how disgusting it is in my opinion 
I don't even know where else to turn, man. Like that that that's how I feel about the way the tackling is and what these guys are doing on defense to these receivers and running backs. Yeah, you know, the the hit on Gronk really bothers me. Uh you know, most of the time and this goes back long before the the whole helmet hit became an issue. Um, we, we saw safeties and corners, smaller defenders, um, try to go lower on big, beefy tight ends, you know, just to try to take them down. But when I say go lower, I mean, we're talking hits to like the ankles, you know, take their legs out um, in a safe manner. But you look at Rob Gronkowski, who's like 600 feet tall and like 800 pounds. His upper body is as big as my entire body. There's this huge, huge target area that's just his torso. Uh, the defender wasn't even tall enough to hit Gronk in the helmet if he tried. Why not launch right at his body? I mean, if you're going to shoulder tackle, hit him in the chest or the shoulder. You're probably going to at least slow him down enough for everybody else to wrap him up and take him down. Or if you're going to go low, go low, low. Uh, it looks a lot like the hit Matt Elam laid on Randall Cobb, you know, just unnecessarily targeted directly at the knee. Um, luckily for Cobb, well, I, I don't even know if it's luckily, but it didn't tear up anything in his knee. It just gave him a slight fracture in his, oh, right, in right, his bone, absolutely. you know. But it's and that was just a, a miss by mere inches. You know, it was a lucky miss, really, more than anything. So you're right. I don't like it. And part of me feels just the tiniest little bit bad for these defenders because they know they can't go high anymore. And, you know, they're they're still trying to figure out what to do. But poor tackling, especially, you know, I showed you on the Packers, probably the worst tackling team in the league. Um, tackling is an issue uh, league you wide. You know, you don't even really have to go to these injuries to to have examples of poor tackling. You can go back to this past Sunday, the Cincinnati Bengals and the Indianapolis Colts and LeVon Brazil absolutely did not deserve that. Well, he deserved that touchdown. He should not have scored (laughs) a touchdown. Six guys and not one guy, Nick, six guys did not use one hand to try and take this guy down. They all threw shoulders. And if I was, if I was Marvin Lewis, I would have given all six guys, guys, and that includes Terrence Williams, or excuse me, Terrence Newman, their walking papers for that shit show of a performance on that particular play. That was absolutely ridiculous. Levon Brazil just basically he manned himself was what it looked like. I mean, it was he he looked like Hercules in that play when it really wasn't that that wasn't the case at all. It was just. Six guys just had wanted nothing to do with tackling him and just made absolutely ridiculous attempts at throwing shoulders at the guy, hoping he would just fall down. Man, that play, I was like livid watching that play. I don't know. I'm I'm going off on a rant now. You can cut me off anytime you want. <laughs> I'm with you, though. It's, the tackling in the NFL is just poor. And <laughs> yes, anywho, anywho, uh, I'm with you all the way. Uh, anywho, moving to Jake Cutler and uh, Josh McCown, the situation in Chicago just it continues to get crazier. Uh, ESPN's total QBR stat is a stat that I think is total garbage. But I just heard this, you know, walking into the office um, right before we were going to do the show. Uh, Josh McCown this season has the best total QBR in the NFL, and it's. 20 point a little over 20 points higher than jay cutler's um we heard mark tressman come out and say you know jay cutler is is our starting quarterback as soon as he's healthy he will be the guy uh for me this is i don't know here josh mccown has has been basically everything the bears always hoped jay cutler would be i don't see how mark tressman can pull him out especially when they're making a run for the playoffs and not to mention fantasy owners, you know, just to look at it from our selfish standpoint for a second, uh, McCown has been lighting it up, has been maybe what got people to the playoffs, what could get people through the playoffs. And then he might get replaced this week or next week by Jay Cutler, right when you need him most. Uh, Cutler's going to be rusty. Yes, he has decent matchups, but he hasn't played in a while. When he did try to come back and play, he just got re-injured right away. So I, for me personally, you know, being uh, a stay-at-home NFL coach, uh, I would go with the hot hand with McCown. I don't see how you can go with Cutler. What, what do you think here? Yeah, I, I tend to agree with going with the hot hand. Josh McCown is extremely hot right now. And you're right. They brought Jay Cutler back a couple weeks ago, and he was in for, what was it, one quarter, injured himself, and was taken out right away. So I I think... Tressman's going to stick with Josh McCown. I think that's the smart move. But what do the Bears do 
going into next season here, you got Jay Cutler, who's going to become a free agent. There's talk all around the league about the Tennessee Titans making a strong play for Jay Cutler. And people, you know, and, and Bears fans alike are talking like Josh McCown's the guy for the future. Now, my question to you, Nick, is Josh McCown is no spring chicken. Guy's been in the league for, this is his 11th season. He's the guy in 2004, Nick, that on 4th and 25 threw a prayer to the back of the end zone when the Minnesota Vikings were playing the Arizona Cardinals. Nate Poole came down with the ball. Denard Walker pushed him out of bounds, and they ruled that he was pushed out. They called it a touchdown, kicked the Vikings out of the playoffs, and put the Packers into the playoffs, prompting the city of Green Bay to bring Nate Poole to, to the city of Green Bay and giving him a key to the city. I mean, that's how long Josh McCown's been in the league now. I don't foresee a guy who's been a journeyman backup quarterback his entire life although he's had a great year this year I just don't see him all of a sudden becoming a starting quarterback if I'm the Chicago Bears I stick with Jay Cutler I bring Jay Cutler back am I am I wrong here or am I right uh it's I mean you're mostly right it's it's such a huge weird situation I love that you brought that game up the the revenge of Denny Green game I used to call it um <laughs> I haven't thought about that game in a while. That Still was crazy. burns inside. Oh, I know. Cause I, I mean, as a Packer fan, obviously I was cheering like crazy for the Arizona. That was just such a crazy game. I remember that. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it, maybe he would be the QB of the future for Chicago if he wasn't already 34 years old. Um, I mean, he does have a lot less mileage on his body being a career backup. So, you know, playing age wise, he's probably not 34 yet, but at the same time, it, it's a hard risk. Tressman has done an amazing job of building the perfect balance between the offense that he wants and tailoring it to the players that he has, which has given them such success in all facets to the offensive side of the ball. But at the same time, you know, you're looking at Jay Cutler. If you can't lock him up to a long-term deal where he's going to want at least 14 and a half, 15 million dollars a year, at least bottom line, uh, you're looking at franchising him for a year and paying him 16.8 ish million dollars at this point. Um, that's a lot of money when they have 11 starters that they need to, you know, look at bringing back next year. Um, they lock up Cutler with that franchise tag for one year for the 16 million. Uh, well, nearly 17 million. You're looking at maybe only bringing back four of those starters now. Uh, Josh McCown is going to give you a much cheaper option um, and probably give you a couple of years before you have to look at rebuilding down the road. You know, maybe maybe get a quarterback in the draft this year and build him behind McCown. Uh, I think McCown could. I don't know. I don't want. I don't want to say he could play at this level for an entire season next year because you know defenses are going to make adjustments. Um, we've seen you know quarterbacks in their second year as a starter struggle to keep it going, but I think yep. he could be a serviceable starter. Uh, I, I don't think he could do any worse than Jay Cutler did in his time so far with the Bears this year. I think the the problem is you have to look more long term. Jay Cutler is four or five years younger, um, so obviously he gives you more longevity. Yeah, I, that that's my thought process too. Is that Jay Cutler is younger? He's a big he's a big arm. I mean, he he does have you know the ability to Christian ponder it up, if you will, and throw the ball <laughs> to the other team quite a bit. But he, you know, he's he does have a big arm, and he can be a prolific quarterback. We have seen great things out of Jay Cutler. We've also seen the very worst of Jay Cutler on the field as well. But I, I I just don't see a situation where they unless you know unless they think that they can win now going into next twenty fourteen, they it's a win now type of scenario and they think Josh McCown gives them the best opportunity to, to win now, then yeah, I, I could see where they would do that. But if you're looking for as in a long term type of deal, I, I, I would think you would bring Jay Cutler back. And like I said early on, I, jo Josh McCown, this is his 11th year in the league, and he's been a journeyman backup the entire time. What makes him a starter all of a sudden now? I, I just, I, I, I agree with you 100% in the fact that teams are going to have film on him. They'll be able to adjust, and you, 
I don't think you're going to see next year out of, out of Josh McCown that what you're seeing right now. So that's just my thoughts on it. Anyway, don't go anywhere. When we get back, Paul Greco joins us. We'll ask him who he's loving this weekend and who he's hating in 2014. You're listening to Fantasy Forecast Central Radio right here on the Pro Football Central Radio Network. Football fans, check out ProFootballCentral.com for all the latest NFL news and analysis. Also check out the very popular Pro Football Central Radio Network for awesome NFL talk around the league. Go to ProFootballCentral.com. ProFootballCentral.com. Hey everyone, check out TomahawkShades.com and get your lethally stylish pair of sunglasses. Great quality for a great price. And welcome back to Fantasy Forecast Central. Joining us now is Paul Greco. Paul is a fantasy writer at FP. 911.com. You can also find him on KABB's Fox 29 daytime show in San Antonio, Texas, where he has a weekly fantasy football bit. We appreciate you taking the time to join us again, Paul. How's it going? Oh, man, it's going awesome. How are we doing, fellas? Uh, we're doing great. Thanks for coming on again. Um, you know, we saw we saw AP go down with what looked like a really horrific injury initially. Now we find out, luckily, you know, no tears, no, no surgery required. It's just a sprain. But uh, let's go worst case scenario just for a minute and pretend Adrian Peterson is out for the rest of the season. In your opinion, is Toby Gerhardt a running back one uh, for the last three weeks? Running back one? No. No, he'll, he'll be a running back two. And if you were a smart fantasy owner, uh, you probably would have picked him up prior to going into the playoffs. And this way, you don't fall into the, the black hole that is, you know, Adrian Peterson possibly going down. And, you know, we, we do a lot of stuff uh, with the guys up in Pennsylvania with ESPN. And one of the things that we talked about prior to going into the playoffs is if you have this quote unquote number one running back, you have to take a look at your roster, uh, drop the, what I like to call the D bag on your team. That's not going to do you any good and pick up the backup running back to your number one, just in case, because you don't want to be trying to scramble to the waiver wire because your number one goes down on your player trip, trying to get yourself to the Super Bowl. So hopefully you were smart enough to go ahead and pick up these, you know, running backs that are backing up number one, just in case it's called insurance. That's why we get it. That's why we do it. And you should have done it before moving into your playoffs. Um, okay, Paul, looking a four, uh, to 2014 for just a minute here. Um, okay. Yeah, you know, I'm, trying guys like, through, I'm trying to get through week 15 of the playoffs, fellas. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. Uh, guys like Alshon Jeffrey. I mean, I'm, looking, oh, I'm, looking at like, I'm looking at like 2021 when my son's the, uh, is an RB1. I'm, I'm not far out, so let's go. Let's <laughs> uh, guys like Alshon Jeffrey, Josh Gordon, Eddie Lacy um, have all stepped up big. And obviously their draft uh, stock is skyrocketing at this point. Who are sure. some popular names we've always seen in the top few rounds that you see sliding down the draft boards now to make room for the new blood? Sliding down? Oh, Andre Johnson. I mean, you, you, we, let's just talk about that for a second. I mean, this is a guy that I think – I would think the astute fantasy player knew going into the season that he was in the top ten, but always seems to get drafted because he's Andre Johnson. The guy's never scored double-digit touchdowns, but yet we continue to sit there and flounder to – to him because of the name. Uh, so he'd be a guy that I would probably say uh, would step down. Um, maybe Vincent Jackson. I'm, I'm not too sure. I mean, uh, you know, Vincent Jackson to me was a guy that was a, was a top 10 wide receiver coming into the season because I think we had a lot of hope at the quarterback position that they continue to work his way. And, again, he, he has right now, if you take a look at his numbers, he only got six touchdowns and he's barely over 1,000 yards. So uh, he would probably be a, another wide receiver. And then, uh, you know, not that he was top 10, but again, is, is a name. He's a touchdown maker. It'll be Wes Welker. You know, I think there was a great article uh, in ESPN talking about whether or not Wes Welker should probably retire because of the amount of bruises that he takes. So at the wide receiver position, that, those would probably be three guys that I would look at that I wouldn't want to draft next year that probably went in the top 10. If not top 10, probably top 12. And you make a great point there, Paul, with Wes Welker, you know, suffering a second concussion. Oh, I know. I know. Well, that's why years. you have me on, right? That's why you yeah, have me exactly. on. Yeah, exactly. Of okay, course, that's what we've been sure. here for. Okay, I, just, you know, I just want to make sure that, that was the reason it wasn't something else. Like, you guys have a bounty on me, just trying to bring me in and find me out on my GPS or something. So I'm glad that I'm bringing you guys extra value by uh, the stuff that's used out of my mouth. Uh, sticking with the theme there just for a minute, um, you touched on a couple guys, but is there anyone that just, like, unequivocally, absolutely, you are avoiding next year just based on this year alone? Yeah, it's going to be Andre Johnson. I mean, to me, he's got the Pamela Anderson disease, right? I mean, you know, she, she looks good on the outside, but if you get inside, you're going to walk away with, like, you know, hepatitis or, you know, the clap or something like that. So I would say Andre Johnson is the guy that I'm going to absolutely 100% Pamela Anderson. All right, we're talking to 
Paul Greco here, fantasy writer for FP911.com, right here on Fantasy Forecast Central. Paul, let's go back to, uh, or let's come back to 2013, the here and the now. Hey, that's great. Whew, thank <laughs> you. What, what's the likelihood that Mike Shanahan sits Robert Griffin III this weekend, and should owners really be legitimately concerned here? I think they should be concerned anytime you have Mike Shanahan at the helm. I mean, you know, there's a reason why they came up with the shenanigans at the running back position because you just never knew what was going to happen, right? I mean, this is a guy that flies by the seat of his pants. He's not, you know, he's not like the hoodie where, you know, even when the hoodie's trying to hide stuff, you have at least a decent feeling as far as who might be playing at the running back position there in, you know, in New England. But, you know, anytime Mike Shanahan gets involved, you have to be concerned as a fantasy owner. It's one of the reasons why, you know, you should avoid. But, uh, again, who would have thought coming into the season that RG3 would be where he's at? I mean, he was coming he coming off the injury. People were talking highly about the production that he might be able to do. And when you take a look at the numbers, uh, and as a Jet fan, I guess I can brag about it, but Geno Smith's numbers are just as good uh, as RG3's. And that, you know, that shouldn't be happening. You know, RG3 is one of those types of players. I think he's a dynamic player. I, I'm not going to – I think the knee injury has a lot to do with it, though. Like, you know, I think he came back a little bit too quickly. Uh, you know, after seeing 18, what he was able to do, I think these NFLers think that they can come back even faster and even stronger when they probably should take that extra time to rest, especially someone at a young age like RG3. I thought he should have stayed back, wait, maybe take a little bit more time to make sure you're fully healed. And I don't know what you guys have played. I don't know if you guys played, like, badminton in high school or whatever, but uh, I, played, I played football, soccer, baseball, uh, and basketball. And as a kid, badminton. as a young one, what would you play? I did not play badminton. <laughs> oh, I was, I, well, maybe it was like, you know, you know, com- competitive Dungeons and Dragons. Whatever you got to play. <laughs> um, well, my this, point is, is that as, as a young rocks. male, you know, as, as a young male, you know, we, we have it in our brains that we can come back, you know, quicker. And even when we're not fully healthy, and I, I can only say from experience playing in college, you know, I, I ripped my hamstring. I had a hole in my hamstring. And they told me six to eight weeks. Well, in four weeks, I'm like, I feel great. And then, boom, I go in for one game, and I was done the rest of the season because I retore it. So, you know, RG3 in the situation, I'm very, very concerned uh, for fantasy owners that have to deal with that issue. So does this go back to the earlier question that Nick asked you and being smart and having already gone out and picked up Kirk Cousins here and possibly used him as a replacement this weekend? I don't think so. I'm, I'm hoping that you were smart enough that RG3 was not your number one, first of all, because coming into the season, he shouldn't have been your number one because of the injury. So I'm hoping that you actually have a better quarterback situation than having to rely on RG3. If you take a look at the numbers, if you had RG3 as your number one quarterback, you better have hoped that you had AP, LaShawn Johnson at your running back position, Megatron, um, I mean, you know, Julius Thomas at the tight end, because those are the guys that would have carried your team. I don't think you're going into the playoffs you know, with a guy like RG3 at the helm at the, at the wide receiver, excuse me, at the quarterback position without having a running back and a wide receiver that actually carried your team. All right, Paul, we got one last question here for you. That's Michael it. Floyd. Awesome. What's that? I said, that's awesome. Man. This is go, this goes oh. quick with you guys. You guys are pretty good. I don't care what they're saying on Twitter and all that stuff. I got you guys back. You guys are doing a great job. We're doing C plus work. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. If you want to go that high, I mean, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> I'll take a C plus from Paul Greco. <laughs> Michael Floyd was a guy that owners have been able to rely on here for the past month, yeah. Paul, but he mm-hmm. disappeared in a big way here this past weekend. Is he a guy that owners can still rely on here going forward? And who are other few names that you're looking to maybe ride high throughout the rest of the playoffs? And conversely, a couple of guys that you're looking to avoid, say like Andre Johnson. So, again, uh, you know, this is a great question. It's a question that's coming up across the board. Uh, you're like the third show that I've done that has, is looking at that, and that's good because that shows that you guys are astute, you know, fantasy owners and players because you're not only taking a look at just the players' names, but you're looking at the schedule not only for this week, but potentially for those that play 14, 15, and 16, and 16 being the Super Bowl, how you might be able to match up um, next week. I'll answer well, it's your my first Dungeons question. and Dragons background. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, dude, you have to have that. I mean, Dungeons and Dragons was, you know, that's that was the that was the, the king of fantasy. Remember, remember when the cool kids were the jocks and the nerds were the nerds? It's kind of reversed now, right? The nerds are like the cool kids, and the jocks are like, whatever, dude, get out of here, man. We can we don't care how much you can lift. Um, 
my point being, though, coming all the way back to Michael Floyd, right, is I'll, I'll go back to a very famous coach that said uh, he is who we thought he was. I mean, that, if you're relying on him to, to carry you through the playoffs, um, then, again, it's the same situation as an RG3. I mean, you got lucky, you got in, but it's, you know, it's not players that you can – that you can rely on with, with the names like that. You have, you know, even though he was, he's the biggest, most ad drop this year was Michael Floyd. I mean, he, you, you know, you talk about a guy that, that got picked up, was able to carry and then disappeared. But if you're an astute fan, you know, you knew it's kind of like economics guys. And I, I don't know how much you guys know about, about the lot of economics and how it goes up and how it goes down with players that you pick up off the bench. It's like riding an economic wave, meaning that you're going to get your highs, but then you have to understand that when he hits the peak of that high, at some point it's going to come down and it's going to bite you in the ass. That's what fantasy is all about. And it's, I think a lot more we're starting to take a look into that. You take a look at uh, the fan duels of the world and the daily fantasy sports. That's how the winners start to identify players that they're going to select based off the value um, and the performances. So I don't want to get all nerdy on you guys because I'm really not that nerd, but I understand the economic uh, portions of fancy and how to utilize that in order to win games. So Michael Floyd, to me, guys, is a guy that you cannot rely on. I think he's in the, the valley type right now, and you're going to have to take a look at guys over the last two weeks that have started to perform that you might be able to put in because of injuries that happened two weeks ago. How was that? Was that pretty, was that pretty awesome? You guys want, they want to cut that one up there because it's kind of long, but it was really, really smart. No, I, I, I was digging it, and you know what? I, you know, you kind of make me feel bad because in college I slept through econ. So Yo, I, dude, I, failed I didn't twice. take anything Don't out of econ. I, I slept every day in that class. <laughs> yeah, I failed it twice, but I'm pretty good at it now. I'm not. I'm not gonna lie. I, I, I did microeconomics. I failed it twice. So, and now I'm running well, I, the country. I was lucky enough to slide by with that C average, so I I, I made it through in one in one showing. So, <laughs> nice. well, Paul, that's all we have for you today. We know you're a busy guy. We'll let you get out of here. Uh, take care and enjoy the games this weekend, and we'll talk again soon. All right, fellas. It's been uh, my pleasure. My pleasure. And, and remember, watch out for Pamela Anderson. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot, Paul. All right. That Later was guys. Paul Greco. Great guest, in my opinion, probably the best guest we've had on the show. I love that guy. You can follow Paul on Twitter, at Paul Greco. We're going to step away here and pay the bills, but when we come back... We're going to dive into our Week 15 Starts and Sits. You're listening to Fantasy Forecast Central right here on the Pro Football Central Radio Network. When it comes down to making money, Danny B is your best bet. Call 800-308-9003. That's 800-308-9003. Or log on to 800-308-9003.com for a free play. Whether you are a $50 player, a $500 player, or a novice better, Danny B can teach you how to maximize your bankroll and think like a pro. Call or log on today, 800-308-9003.com. That's 800-308-9003.com. We are back. You're listening to Fantasy Forecast Central. Right now, we're going to take some time to look at some guys that you should definitely have in your starting lineup this weekend in the fantasy playoffs. And conversely, some dudes you should probably try to avoid. Uh, at the top of the list, and uh, he, there's going to be a couple qualifiers in this list, I'm thinking. Uh, if Adrian Peterson is indeed out, uh, Toby Gerhardt is a must start for me against Philadelphia. He's averaging over, oh, man, I had it right here, and then I closed it, uh, 7.9. Over nine yards to carry. Uh, actually, 7.9. Well, yeah, total this season. In the last four games, 7.9 yards per carry, over 200 yards. Um, he's just killing it. One touchdown. And in three of the four of those games, you know, that was as in tandem with Adrian Peterson. He racked up eight or 91 yards on just eight carries against Green Bay um, and another 89 yards on 15 carries against Baltimore. Uh, as the starter, the sole starter, you know, with no Adrian Peterson to spell him, we're looking at maybe close to 20 carries, uh, easily probably breaking the century mark. Uh, he has a pretty good matchup, too, against Philadelphia this week, who's played better on defense recently, but they've still given up over 1,700 total yards, nine total touchdowns to opposing running backs, and they're giving up 15.5 fantasy points per game. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I, I think if Adrian Peterson doesn't go and – not to get off topic too far. Again, I kind of do that at times. But I believe Adrian Peterson shouldn't go. That's just me. I, I I, don't think it's worth the risk here right now. And that being said, 
if Toby Her- Toby Gerhardt, excuse me, gets the nod, he's an absolute start. He should give you running back two numbers minimum, in my opinion, with running back one upside. The guy I'm looking at is pretty much a no-brainer, Antonio Brown. And the reason I, I mention Antonio Brown is last week he was a guy that I was a little bit worried about when it came to starting him against a real tough Miami Dolphins secondary that had only given up one touchdown to opposing wide receivers up to that point. But he came out, did his thing, and really, in my mind, solidified himself as a must-start the rest of the way through here, regardless of whether he comes up small this week uh, against the Cincinnati Bengals. I think he's a start the following week as well. He's put himself into that every week start conversation. And look, the the Bengals, although they've been pretty decent on defense, just got shredded by something called Levon Brazil and Derek Rogers. So I think Antonio Brown should be fine here this Sunday. Yeah, I'm with you all the way. Um, he's He's just been a stud. These last, what, maybe seven, eight games. Big Ben has come on so strong with like a million touchdowns, only three interceptions. Tony O'Brown is all day this week. I'm with you. Um, Another qualifier. I guess I'm the king of qualifiers today. Uh, If Aaron Rodgers is cleared and gets to play against the Dallas Cowboys, I am all in on Jarrett Boykin this week. Um, You know, a few weeks ago, well, quite a few weeks ago now, when we saw Jarrett Boykin go down, we actually said that he wasn't going to do anything because he was a product of Aaron Rodgers. You know, we saw, well, we never really got to see anyone do anything with uh, Seneca Wallace, but we saw a little bit of success with Scott Tolzien and uh, even some with Matt Flynn. Uh, Jared Boykin's the real deal. He's a skilled receiver. He's fast. He has good hands. Uh, and let's face it, Aaron Rodgers is going to make use of that. Aaron Rodgers is not a big fan of most of the tight ends on the team. Uh, now that Finley's gone, he's going to look to get... Uh, Jordy in the mix, uh, James Jones, and Jared Boykin against Dallas' secondary. All three of these guys can eat. Obviously, Jordy's a definite must-start, no-brainer, so that's why I went with Boykin here. But I think he could have a really big day against Dallas if Aaron Rodgers is the quarterback. If. The big if. And I hope Aaron Rodgers goes this week. I would like to see Aaron Rodgers play again here soon. I would like to see what Aaron Rodgers could do when the when the Packers kind of have their backs against the wall here in terms of a playoff run, they're, they're, they're right on that brink. I, I don't know the exact numbers right now. I don't know if they're on the outside looking in or if they're clinging on to the last spot there at the, in the wild card. But I'd like to see what the Packers could do with their backs against the wall, and he would definitely make use of Jared Boykin if he was, if he was the starting quarterback here this Sunday. A guy I'm looking at, and I, a guy that, has kind of fallen off here the last month without Reggie Wayne by his side is T.Y. Hilton. But I say start T.Y. Hilton this week, and here's why, Nick. Check out this stat line. In three career games against the Houston Texans, T.Y. Hilton has 14 receptions for 310 yards and five touchdowns. The dude rips the Texans up. And one of those games is without Reggie Wayne this past or this earlier this season. That was the first game without Reggie Wayne that the Colts played without him. So I say start T.Y. Hilton. You know, I, I can get behind this easily. Um, for everything you said, plus the fact that my boy Derek Rogers, who I have just been pounding the table for since before the draft, finally got his shot last week, just went off. Uh, the defense is going to key in on him and try to slow him down. Um, He played three times as many snaps as Darius Hayward Bay, who obviously, you know, struggles with the dropsies. So I think Hilton's going to get a ton of targets and have a huge day. Uh, And another guy that I'm weary of just a little, but I like this pick is Delaney Walker versus Arizona. He's coming back from concussion, but he should be solid and ready to go this week. Um, he's actually had better numbers with Ryan Fitzpatrick than with Jake Locker. And let's just say he's actually a really good pass catching tight end. Arizona is the worst defense against tight ends. I see Delaney Walker having a big day and a good pickup for Gronk owners. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree. Uh, the one thing that concerns me is that his production spiked here a few weeks ago and 
he had like a three week stint where he was a top five tight end each week, and then the last couple of weeks he's he's fallen off, and the production just hasn't been there. But yeah, versus versus the Arizona Cardinals, that's a that's a pretty juicy matchup, and 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 one that Delaney Walker should take advantage of. Switching to sits, Nick, guys that probably shouldn't be in fantasy owners lineups here for the playoffs. And this is an obvious one, but I still want to put it out there. So people who think that because they drafted Victor Cruz so high in terms of wide receivers that they need to play him. And and, and that's just not the case here. He's going to be shadowed all day long by Seattle Seahawks, all world cornerback Richard Sherman. And look, Victor Cruz hasn't scored a touchdown since week four anyway. Too risky during the playoffs, in my opinion. If he has a big day, oh well. Ain't nothing you can do, but it's not worth the risk. Uh, I say sit him at this point in the season. Uh, yes, I, I agree with you completely. Um, especially just Seattle's defense is just so good. Uh, Richard Sherman is just an unstoppable force. Obviously, he's going to be locked down on Cruz. Uh, Cruz is just doing nothing this week. Uh, Eli Manning is going to be on his ass most of the game anyway, so I just really see nothing happening there. Um, another player from a game and team we just talked about, uh, CJ 2K, uh, CJ whatever the hell K you want to call him, um, going up against Arizona last week, uh, Sean Green had just as many carries, uh, or sorry, excuse me, he had three less carries than Chris Johnson in the same amount of yards, one more touchdown. Uh, Chris Johnson's just been garbage most of the season. Arizona is one of the best running back, or uh, excuse me, they are the best defense against opposing running fantasy running backs this season. They haven't even given up a thousand rushing yards yet. Uh, just slightly over a thousand total yards, only four touchdowns. And they're the only defense giving up less than 10 fantasy points per game. The Arizona Cardinals on defense, they're a force, and, and, and they're not talked about because the Kansas City Chiefs, in terms of fantasy, have dwarfed them. And you look at the Seattle Seahawks in, in terms of to overall defense, they're, they're in the same division. So, so the Cardinals get left behind, but they they do a really good job at stopping the run. It'll be interesting to see how they change on defense with the absence of Tyron Matthew. Because Tyron Matthew is a pretty good asset in the run game, stopping the run at the at the cornerback position. So I I I'll be interested to watch how they how they you know react to, to him not being on the field. But I'm with you. Chris Johnson's too much of a liability. He's in that Victor Cruz conversation for me. He could have an he could have a monster game. And then he could put 12 yards up for you. So, yeah, he's too much of a risk. I I'm I got him on my bench as well. Another guy that I'm sitting is Bobby Rainey. And the reason I'm I, sitting him and maybe got maybe owners aren't going to be able to. They, they have to play Bobby Rainey. But he's kind of a risky play here against a tough San Francisco 49ers defense. San Fran's run defense is at an elite level in comparison to the Buffalo Bills who he just played against, which Rainey did post 127 yards and a touchdown. However, subtract that 80-yard touchdown run on the first play of the game, and his day would have been like this, 21 carries for 47 yards, and nothing yeah. for PP on PPR owners either. He had four catches for a negative three yards. Little too risky for my liking here, Nick, in the heart of the playoffs. But that's just me. No, I'm with you. I'm not a big fan of any running backs going up against San Francisco. Um, and Ra and you're right with Rainey. Uh, the Buffalo game. It's so important to look deeper into numbers than just uh, you know the box score stats. Because if you just pull up the box score and see like, oh, okay, 22 carries for 100 plus yards, like, oh wow, he did awesomely. But you go back and subtract that just out one carry out, it's a huge difference. And uh, let's face it, San Francisco is not going to be giving up any 80 yard runs anytime soon. So no, I just, I just that front seven of San Francisco is just so big, so strong, so talented. Arguably the two best middle linebackers in football. 
Um, it's just going to be a hard day for Rainey to get anything going. Uh, another guy that I've actually played a couple times this season and with pretty good success is John Carlson, a tight end from your Minnesota Vikings. Uh, coming off concussion, he is going to have to pass some tests to be cleared to play. But everything I'm reading, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, is that he might uh, probably be ready to go against Philly. The problem is that the Eagles are the second best defense against opposing tight ends this year. Um, they've given up just 650 yards receiving and only two touchdowns. Um, and they're giving up a measly 5.2 fantasy points per game to opposing tight ends, which is the second fewest in the league. Um, the Eagles defense, uh, at least against the pass, has really stepped up lately and started to perform better. Uh, I just don't see Carlson being able to get it going against Philadelphia if he plays this week. Well, first of all, I, I, I don't know, and nothing's been confirmed as far as I've heard whether or not John Carlson is going to be cleared to play. But I wonder, and I haven't looked into any numbers, I haven't dove deep into the stats to find this out, but I wonder if the, the Philadelphia Eagles being so good numbers-wise against the tight end position is just because teams are lighting them up with the wide receivers week in and week out, and there's just no need for the tight end. I I mean, I don't know if that's a legitimate question to even ask. I don't know if that's, you know, I don't know. I just, I, I find that the, I find it weird that wide receivers can eat all day long against the Philadelphia Eagles, but they, they lock down the tight end. And I wonder if it, if it has a lot to do with the fact that, quarterbacks just don't need to utilize the tight end against the Eagles defense because wide receivers are open on every play. But yeah, I'm with you right with I'm with you to an extent if he if he, obviously he's got to be cleared to play before before you make any decisions, but you know, the Minnesota Vikings, I would say this. Matt Castle, he's been with the emergence of Cordero Patterson here or Cordero Patterson however you pronounce it, the the last couple of weeks, he's been, or John Carlson, excuse me, he's been Christian Ponder and Matt Castle's best friend. So I'm just going to leave it at that. I, 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 I think it's a little bit risky to have him in there because you don't know what to expect from the Vikings offense in general, especially if AP doesn't play. Is Toby Gerhardt, who we think is going to have a nice day if he does start and play and get 20 touches. We don't know how he being in the lineup affects the way defenses, you know, defend everybody else. Not sure. I think it's a, too iffy to 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 have him in the lineup. To, excuse me, to have John Carlson in the lineup. Another tight end, Nick, and you know, is a guy that you and I have been high on, and he came he, he came to the surface here and exploded the last couple of weeks and put up some really good numbers in. Unlimited touches, really, is Ladarius Green. I can only imagine how many fantasy seasons this dude ended this past week, including one of mine in a league with a very big purse at that. <laughs> but if you were lucky enough to squeeze by with a win despite the goose egg he posted, go ahead and sit him this week because owners just can't risk having that happen again. That, and he did only have one reception for 25 yards in the Chargers' last meeting with the Broncos. So I say sit Ladarius Green. Yeah, you know, Ladarius Green is uh, is a touchy subject for a lot of us who cross over between the draft Nick world and the fantasy football world. We've been high on him for a while. Um, you know, when San Diego had a number of injuries, and obviously with Antonio Gates always being on the precipice of missing game because of an injury, uh, everybody was so high on Ladarius Green, me included. Uh, two weeks ago, we saw him get a career-high 91% of the snaps in the offense, had a huge day. Uh, then Eddie Royal returns, and we see a drop down to around 60% of the snaps, which could continue to go down. Uh, I love this kid. He's a talented, physical playmaker, and he's going to be fantasy gold in the in the coming months, but or coming years, excuse me. But right now, as long as Antonio Gates is healthy on the field, Eddie Royal's back, Keenan Allen's doing his thing. There's just not enough room for Green in that offense. You know, Danny Woodhead too. So, it, unfortunately, you've got to sit Green against Denver this week. Yeah, and I was, I was so high on him this week. I thought he was going to have such a good game. He was going to continue to ride that wave that he's been on the last few weeks, and 
I inserted him. I, I'm a Jordan Reed owner in that league, and unfortunately, Jordan Reed wasn't able to go. I had picked up Ladarius Green earlier in the week as a precautionary you know, move on my part, and they said they said Jordan Reed was inactive, so I plugged him in, and I thought I was going to get a decent enough day from him, and I got zero, and that cost me. It literally cost me my my fantasy season in that particular league. So it was a heartbreaker to say the least, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. I'm sure there's others out there who started Ladarius Green, and their fantasy season is over as well. So if you were lucky enough, to get by and make it to the next round of the playoffs, go ahead, sit him, put somebody else in, somebody who's going to give you better production this week coming up. All right, Nick and I are going to step away for a minute here, pay some bills, but when we get back, we'll be talking to Lenny Meldick of the Roto Experts Fantasy Show on Sirius XM. We're going to talk to him and ask him what his thoughts are on the New England Patriots situation. You're listening to Fantasy Forecast Central right here on the Pro Football Central Radio Network. Hey everyone, check out TomahawkShades.com and get your lethally stylish pair of sunglasses. Great quality for a great price. Shades on, problems gone. TomahawkShades.com Welcome back to Fantasy Forecast Central. How are you not supposed to be pumped after that music? Uh, joining us now is longtime fantasy guru Lenny Melnick. Uh, you can find Lenny dishing out fantasy advice on the Roto Experts Fantasy Show on Sirius XM Radio, Sirius Channel 210, XM Channel 87. You can also catch his Roto Radio podcast on blogtalkradio.com. Thanks for stopping by, Lenny. We're excited to have you. How's it going today? Yeah, it's going great after a night last night. You know, I'm normally not a late night person, but I got to tell you something. Uh, the the only fantasy football league that I care about, I'm in the playoffs, and uh, something that we should probably talk about: the opposing team that I that, that I played against um, got 40 points out of the Kansas City Chief defense. 40 points, all right, and it uh, it killed me. So I went into the game last night. With uh, Sean Mc- with uh, uh, McCowan uh, against his Des Bryant, and uh, I was just so pumped up, especially after Bryant caught that first touchdown. That I stayed up for the whole night, and I'm shot for the rest of the day. So there you go. You know what? I'm with you there because I had a 15 point lead going into last night in the playoffs. I had Des, he had McCown. Obviously, that did not work out well for me in the end. <laughs> right. So I feel you. It was a long night. It was definitely a long night. So I had. You know, I had Kansas City's defense, and I had Josh McCown, yeah, and I had Jamal Charles, and I still lost. Oh, that's not possible. I think you better take <laughs> well, a recount on that one. Because everybody else on my team flopped, so I, I, I lost with that. <laughs> yeah, it's just like the old days when we used to keep the stats by hand before the internet and everything. I would have definitely challenged that one, So <laughs> that's for sure. So, Lenny, as you know, Week 14 saw some big-name players added to the torn ACL list. Uh, Alyssa now includes Rob Gronkowski, unfortunately. Yeah. Who can Gronk owners go out there and turn to at the tight end position at this critical point in the fantasy playoffs? Well, here's the deal. You know, the first reaction to that is who's his backup, all right? That's the first thing we probably think of. And, you know, Matt Mulligan will probably get the call there. And they got a pretty good matchup. Uh, this week against Miami, a team that really gives up a lot of touchdowns to tight ends. However, uh, the uh, reason I was so upset about the Kansas City defense killing me was that my opponent picked them up on waivers and uh, just the following week. I don't know why they were on waivers, but they were. I guess he may, he may have dropped them when they played Denver. Uh, but here's the, here's the thing. You cannot just assume that there's nothing any good on waivers at this time of the year. And when you talk about tight ends, uh, Delaney Walker had a concussion and uh, he didn't play last week. It's very possible. Don't take it for granted that Delaney Walker is not on your waiver wire. He very well could be, depending upon your roster size and uh, things like that. So the first inclination would be to see if Delaney Walker is 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 uh, is, is available. He's got. Not only has he been very productive, but he's got some great matchups against Arizona and Jacksonville and Houston. So uh, he would probably be my first choice. Uh, or you could go the other way and hope to get a different tight end every week. Uh, as I said, you know, Mulligan, 
who probably get the call. Uh, uh, but I had a hard enough time with Hus Mendoza when he was playing, but uh, Humanawanu uh, is hurt, so <laughs> it'll be it'll be Mulligan getting the call going against Miami uh, or Andrew Corliss. He's got a great matchup, boy. That. I'll take anybody going against the Dallas defense, right, <laughs> after what you saw last night. So if you wanted to play it week by week, Andrew Corliss is a good matchup against Dallas. Uh, uh, Delaney Walker you have to take a look at first. Probably Dennis Pitta is not available anymore, but if he is, of course, he's somebody who has come right back into the fray uh, very quickly. Uh, some other names that you'd want to consider could be Ladarius Green, and I think we may have – Thought that Antonio Gates was finished before he's actually finished, but uh, uh, you know he's been pretty productive, and uh, uh, he'll be going against uh, Denver and Oakland. Uh, his last matchup will be Kansas City. That'll be a difficult one if he gets some playing time. And also, uh, you know, Brandon Myers. Uh, now this week, you may want to go with somebody else. But then uh, he's got the Lions in Washington in his last two games. So, yeah, it, it, it's all about the matchups. And uh, if I was in that situation of not having the use of Gronkowski, I would probably play it week by week. And if I had to latch on to one guy, it would probably be um, Andrew Corliss, who I think has got some great matchups, Dallas, Pittsburgh, Chicago. Uh, so I would go that way. Okay, sticking with the Patriots here, the the Pats are averaging 32 points per game with Gronkowski in the lineup and only 21 without him. Uh, What do Tom Brady owners do here, and can they rely on him as they march through the playoffs? Well, I'll tell you what, that's a little misleading because uh, if you remember at the beginning of the season, uh, and as I'm thinking, probably, let's see, Vereen got hurt in the first week, and then he was out uh, probably probably weeks two through six. They were without both Shane Vereen and Gronkowski. So you just can't say Gronkowski out. They didn't have Vereen either, who is really starting to emerge as a, a huge player. And you know, as far as Brady goes, when he didn't have those two guys, he still threw for close to 200 yards in, in almost every game. He had 260 something yards. He had a 300 game. Uh, so I, I don't think that, look, it's, it's not going to help him not to have Gronkowski, but Vereen, who is starting to come around in a standard scoring lead. He had six points, then nine points, then 12 points. And uh, last week he picked up 153 yards. So certainly that's going to help. Uh, uh, look, uh, it's not going to help Brady to lose Gronkowski. But having Vereen there as that safety valve out of the backfield, and if you watched the game last night, you saw how good Matt Forte was in that kind of uh situation, getting those swing passes. That's what Vereen is best at. So I really wouldn't downgrade Brady very much. Uh, it, it, and it's really all about the matchups that he has. And, uh, um, and I think he's got some pretty good ones. He's got Miami, he's got Buffalo, and he's got Baltimore coming up. So uh, I don't think I would be downgrading Brady too much. We're talking to Lenny Melnick, host of the Roto Experts Fantasy, Fantasy Show on Sirius XM Radio. You're listening to Fantasy Forecast Central. Lenny, let's turn our attention to the Minnesota Vikings here and Adrian Peterson for a minute. Oh, my he, gosh. He his foot here in the <laughs> – what's that? Uh, right away when you said turning our attention to the Minnesota Vikings, that just kind of made me a little nauseous. But that's okay. Oh, you're hurting my feelings. I'm, a Minnesota <laughs> guy. I'm yeah. sorry. You listen. And the Vikings are my blood, so you're yeah, hurting well, my feelings a little bit. <laughs> yeah, well, look, I go back to the Vikings when they had Fred – and they had Fred Tarkington and all those guys, so I, I used to be a Viking fan, but not anymore. <laughs> well, unfortunately, I'm stuck with him, so. Yeah, well, go ahead. <laughs> anyway, the, the AP, he sprained his foot uh, in the yeah, second yeah. half against the Baltimore Ravens. Now, looks like, or actually I say early on, it looked like the Vikings may just shut him down, but now there's reports saying that Adrian Peterson is determined to play this uh, this week. This week? And, yeah, he's he's this saying week he went from almost pocket. having he's surgery saying. to playing this week. What for? <laughs> what I, I, for? <laughs> I, I'm I'm with you. I, I'm I, I'm saying shut him down. But Adrian Peterson is you know he's determined to play. You know that's just that's his mentality. He wants to play. Okay. But let's just say he does not play this week. What are any options, if there are any options available for a guy? Who owned AP mm-hmm. and who was you know who could get relatively decent production 
on the waiver wire or maybe somebody that's on their bench because AP is a guy that's pretty much carrying most guy most owners fantasy teams this year. Absolutely, he uh, he's one of those he's one of the running backs that panned out. Jamal Charles panned out, but you take a look. You know, in that league that I was talking about, that I was um, you know, so uh, excited about to win uh, my playoff game last night, my first pick in that league was Calvin Johnson, and my second pick was Jimmy Graham. And I wound up with Eddie Lacy in the fourth round and no and no Sean Marino in round 14. I also had Darren Sproles in there, but uh, uh, I just I just wasn't buying that running back running back thing. However, with Adrian Peterson, you almost can't lose uh, taking him, and he's probably one of the few sure things. Uh, there's a couple of things you got to look at. First of all, uh, if you can look, the first thing you do is look see at the condition of Reggie Bush. Uh, Detroit is home. Uh, if Reggie Bush is still going to be hobbled, then Joyt Bell could be an interesting pickup there. Uh, you take a look at Carolina with uh, Tolbert out with the bad knee and uh, Stewart out with the bad ankle. Uh, you got D'Angelo Williams over there who could emerge. And, of course, uh, Daniel Thomas with his uh, 16 carries, 105 yards and a touchdown. But I think the best move to make is, uh, you know, if you watched Gebhardt run last week, he looked pretty good, had that 41-yard run, and, you know, picked up 89 yards and a touchdown. That's probably the move that you should make. Just go for the backup because it's not always, uh, you know, it's not always the name of the player, but sometimes you put a player into a system, and all of a sudden that player thrives. And you take a look at Minnesota, they have their system is to run the ball with Peterson. So if Gephardt is taking Peterson's role, you know he's going to get every opportunity. The playbook is geared around the running game, and Gephardt, if he's if he's successful, will continue to get the ball. In all likelihood, probably have a have a pretty good game. Well, yeah, he, if he plays and he starts, and he's going to get all the touches if he does yeah. start. Yeah. The Philadelphia <laughs> Eagles are a great matchup for running backs. Uh, yes. <laughs> so Although they, they, I'll tell you what, they've gotten a lot better in recent weeks. You know, uh, the, there was a point where the Eagles were averaging, uh, she was, they were giving up about 28 points a game, but in recent weeks they're, uh, they they brought that down to about 21 points a game, which still isn't good. But it's, uh, you yeah, know, it's, it's, a, it's a much improved defense and they're on a roll. So, uh, I don't think Philadelphia is going to be a pushover. Well, I mean, when you go up against the Minnesota Vikings, anything's possible. You yeah, anything, anything is I mean, possible. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 they could go out there and pitch a shutout against the Vikings. Who knows? So Absolutely. We got one last question here before we let you go, Lenny. Uh, fantasy tension gets elevated here each week when we get closer to our respective fantasy championships. And with that comes a lot more stress in constructing a starting lineup. Given all the matchups here in Week 15, Who's the one player you simply do not trust having in your starting lineup? Oh, well, unfortunately, there's a couple of guys that I don't trust. And, of course, RG3 is the first name that pops out of my head. We don't even know if he's going to start. But you'll probably know about that before uh, lineup time. Um, yeah, I thought Ray Rice would have a, have a decent game this week, but I was wrong, and he's going against Detroit, a very tough team to run against. All right, two guys. One may be a surprise. Uh, Chris Johnson going against Arizona. That's a horrible matchup for Chris Johnson. And here's the surprise uh, Vincent Jackson, uh, who had a touchdown, had a second one called back, but he was playing Buffalo, a team that was just horrible against uh, uh, wide receivers. Wide receivers generally have a field day against Buffalo. He only caught three receptions of his eight targets, and I checked with uh, 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 I checked with some people out of Tampa. He has really been hobbled by a hamstring. And uh, it's not getting any better, they say. As a matter of fact, he was a he was almost a game time decision. So I would really keep my eyes out for Vincent Jackson. And if that hamstring, if he's still on the injured list, I would. I don't say you sit him if he's going to play. You got to play him. But I'd be very careful. I would definitely be careful with him and Rice. And if you look, if you have an alternative to Chris Johnson, I'd absolutely put the, the alternative in if he's any good. Yeah, Chris Johnson's a guy I've never been. I shouldn't say never, but in the last two seasons anyway i've been very very mm-hmm. low on he's just not a guy you can trust at all yeah and, and so about yeah, matchups I'm right, there with, I'm right there with you lenny the the vincent jackson thing i i expected more from him this year yeah. I, or this game i should say i i played him this past week in one of my leagues and i was happy that i got a touchdown but i i really expected a 10 catch game for mm-hmm. 
you know, somewhere in the 150 range, I really thought he was going to tear up the Buffalo Bills. And I was, at the end, I was a little bit disheartened with his uh, output there. Yeah, well, he had he was targeted eight times and only caught three passes, and that's kind of a red flag. But I knew he was he was uh, hobbled with the hamstring, but it was getting worse as the game went on, not any better. And he, look, he still could have had a good game. He had a touchdown, had another one called back, but you know, Buffalo gives up the most fantasy points, second most to wide receivers of any team in the National Football League. So yes, I I expected a lot more from him as well. Be careful; he may be really uh, banged up. Well, Lenny, that's all the time we have for you today. Man, time flies when you're having fun. I want to appreciate, <laughs> you. I want to appreciate you for coming on and taking some time out of your day to talk with us. Anytime. Love it. Let's get a Major League Baseball trade going for today, okay? That's what I'm looking forward to. Oh, there's <laughs> going to be lots. There's going to be lots. Uh-huh. Sure. Okay. Uh, and I love, the, I love the Minnesota signing of Philip Hughes. Uh, it's just that how are they gonna how are they gonna put a fly ball pitcher in there with Ryan Dewitt and right and Josh Willingham and left? I haven't figured that one out. Okay, so we'll see. I haven't even Thanks. got a chance to sit down and like really evaluate what the Twins have done. I've been so you know uh-huh. consumed with football, but yeah, I'd, that's a good point you bring up with Phil Hughes. There, I've, he is a primarily a fly ball pitcher, so it. it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to watch the Twins this year in 2014. So. Uh, we'll, uh, that, we'll take some time here and go pay the bills. But when we okay. come back, we will have, uh, some Twitter questions for you that we'll answer. This is Fantasy Forecast Central. Check out the official store of the Pro Football Central Radio Network at pfcshirts.com to get all your holiday shopping done and be the coolest kid on the block wearing your favorite show's official t-shirt. That's pfcshirts.com and get your swag on. And welcome back to Fantasy Forecast Central Radio. Right now we're going to get to a couple Twitter questions that rolled in over the weekend before we close out today's show. Get First your swag is, on. Get your swag on. God, I love that song. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Mack from Cleveland tweeted to us and asked, looking ahead to the semis next week, who do you like at the flex position? Steven Ridley, Hakeem Nix, Cecil Shorts, or Andre Holmes? Brian, what do you think here? Well, in looking at the matchups here, you have Kansas City versus Oakland. So that, to me, in my mind, rules out Andre Holmes. I think that front seven of Kansas City is going to make it a long and rough day for Matt McGloin. And I don't think he's going to be able to get the ball to his receivers enough to make them effective fantasy wise. You also have Buffalo at Jacksonville and we know the Buffalo bills issues when it comes to covering and defending wide receivers. So I think Cecil shorts makes a great play here this week at the flex position. And you also have to look at potentially Steven Ridley making an impact against the Miami dolphins. Miami dolphins do struggle at defending the run. Although they are very good at defending the pass, they do they do struggle at defending the run. And if Steven Ridley can get the start and he does get back in the good graces with Bill Belichick, I think Steven Ridley is the guy to go with here. I think those are your two guys of that group. I, I say Cecil Shorts and Steven Ridley. I'm with you 100% of the way on Shorts. He was the one I was going to say unequivocally. Um, great matchup against the Bills uh, secondary that's given up 2,400 yards and 17 touchdowns. Uh, 17 touchdowns being tied for the most given up to opposing receivers in the league. Uh, surrendering 26 fantasy points per game. He's the team's legitimate number one. Uh, really the only breakout, like standout receiver right now, as much as I love my boy A. Sanders. Um, so I'm going Shorts all the way here. Um, I don't like Ridley that much. I, I get where you're coming from. I like the matchup. Um, I just think Shane Vereen is the guy for them now. He is the starter. Uh, Ridley would be, you know, in some sort of capacitative backup role where we might only see him touch the ball five times. Uh, or he could have a game where, you know, he carries it 15 and has, you know, 80 yards on the day. So it, it's it's a little more of a, a gamble with Ridley, but it's it's not a bad choice. I just, I like shorts. I think that's a, out of the four, he's probably the surefire bet here. Yeah, of of the four, if you need to pick one, you, I go I go Cecil Shorts. In 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 this order of the four, I go Cecil Shorts, Stephen Ridley, Andre Holmes, and Hakeem Nix. That's how little I think of Hakeem Nix at this point. It's an unfortunate thing. He's just he hasn't scored a touchdown yet this season, and 
the Giants go up against the Seattle Seahawks, and we talked about Victor Cruz earlier in the show go, being matched up with Richard Marshall. I'm sure Hakeem Nix will see some Richard Marshall as well that, during that game. So he, he's he's number four on that list of four guys there. Our second Twitter question comes from, I'll let you pronounce that, Grad Bossy, G-R-A-D-B-A-U-C-I. He tweets, or she tweets, who do I roll with at the flex position? We've got another flex question here. Joik Bell or Marcel Reese? Take it away, Nick. Ooh. Ooh. That, that's a tough one, my friend. Um, just off the top of my head, I have to lean Jock Bell. Um, I've been big on him pretty much all season. I really like what he did, you know, uh, in a supplemental uh, supporting role for J- Reggie Bush. The only problem is the Ravens have been pretty stout against the run. Uh, I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna roll Mar- oh, no because Marcel Reese plays Kansas they got City. Beat oh. up this last week against the Vikings on the run. Yeah, that's true. Uh, oh man, I, I I like Casey's defense better. I gotta go. I gotta go with Jacques Bell here. Um, he brings the. He's just gonna bring his A game. I, I love Marcel Reese too. Man, play either one. Man, this. I'm struggling with this one, my friend. Uh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna <laughs> that go. Jacques is a tough Bell. one, right? I'll, I'll go fifty fifty one percent Jacques, forty nine percent Marcel Reese. I I tend to flip it the other way just a little bit, and if if Jock Bell or Joyke Bell, whatever we want to call him, is the starter, and yes. Reggie Bush is a no go. Like Reggie Bush came up limping in, in warm-ups here this last week, and he didn't go. And Joyke Bell got all the touches, and he put up a pretty nice game. If that's the case, then I go Joyke Bell, but I worry about whether or not Reggie Bush is going to be back. Kansas City do, it ha, does have a good defense, and I feel like Kansas City is going to be forcing Oakland to throw the ball in the second half because they're going to be down quite a bit and that might bode well for PPR owners or PPR players who own Marcel Reese. He might get some points out of the, out of, out of the backfield in the passing game. But if you're in a standard league, if Joyke Bell is the starter, I tend to lean that way. If he's, if it's a PPR league, I tend to lean Marcel Reese's way. I, I, because I think, I think Oakland's going to pass more in the second half, and I think that's going to open things up for Marcel Reese in that aspect. I don't know about running the football, although he did have a pretty good game against the New York Jets this past week, who was number two at against the or excuse me number two and are allowing the second fewest points to opposing running backs, and he ended up tearing up the Jets on the ground. So. Who knows? But I, like I said, I, in standard leagues, I would go with Joyke Bell, and in PPR leagues, I would go with Marcel Reese. And I know that sounds maybe a bit weird because Joyke Bell is pretty good out of the backfield too. But that's that's how I'm breaking it down because that's how close it is for me, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm with you all the way there. It, it's so close to call. Um, you could go either way, but I think I like how you worded it. I, I'll I'll go with your thinking there. Uh, but that's that's it. That's all we have for the show today. Uh, we want to thank Paul Greco and Lenny Melnick for stopping by. Great, great A plus guests. Uh, we love having them on. Paul, you know, his second time, just as funny as his first. And Lenny's such a great dude. Uh, make sure you follow us and them on Twitter. Our Twitter is FF Central Radio. Uh, have a great week and best of luck to everyone out there in Fantasyland. You've been listening to Fantasy Forecast Central right here on the Pro Football Central Radio Network. You have been listening to an exclusive podcast on the Pro Football Central Radio Network. For news, blogs, and other awesome podcasts, please check out ProFootballCentral.com and follow us on Twitter at PFCentral.